Looks like this is going to be the last time we meet together, at least by way of video, and <laughs> at least those of you who are in Boise, Idaho, right? Because next week, you're going to meet each other for the first time in a long time. You're going to meet with each other at the church building. And it's going to, I mean, I know it's been difficult for you to be apart from each other because you're such a solid part of each other's lives. God has made you a part of each other's life, and it's hard to be apart from each other. God is not a social distancing God. He didn't create us for social distancing. He created us for relationship with one another, and he created us for relationship with himself. God is not a social distancing God. In fact, he broke into our world, took on our flesh, lived our lives, died for our sins, was buried and was raised again, and he sent his, his Holy Spirit. When he ascended into heaven, he sent his Holy Spirit to live inside each of us in our body. That is intimate relationship with God. He's made us his temple. We are the body of Christ. His body was sacrificed on the cross and he was raised again. He ascended into heaven in bodily form and he's formed us by his spirit living inside of us as his body. Parts of one another's lives. We are a community that belongs to God. Like Kevin Hooper said a couple weeks ago, we are a community, community made by God to love each other, to be connected to each other heart to heart. God lives among his community and he accomplishes things and many things he accomplishes only in his and through his community, the church. Since this is the last time I'm gonna be able to speak to you by way of video, I want this to be a very important lesson. I want it to be a marked lesson. I spent a lot of time focusing on what I believe is most important. If this is the last sermon I ever preach in my entire life, I want it to be the one lesson that I believe is the most important lesson. And that's why I focused on this title, The Three Stages of Discipleship. So, would you pray with me right now at the beginning of this lesson? Lord, I ask that you would give me wisdom to say the things you want me to say, to say them in the way that you want me to say them, then you would take those words and penetrate and penetrate our hearts. I'm listening to you too, Lord, as I'm trying to flesh out with this group of people that I've grown to love so deeply over the last many years, thank you for our relationship. Thank you for how you've drawn us together, that we know each other. Most of us know each other, and those of us who don't know each other, I pray, God, you'll give us opportunity to meet and grow in relationship with one another. But I pray especially today, if this is the last time that the group of people watching today will have the opportunity to hear me say something. They're gonna hear me say the most important stuff in the world that's gonna radically change their lives for the better. So I ask you these things in Jesus' name and to his glory. Jesus, make these things true by your Holy Spirit. Amen. Three stages of discipleship. We're going to look at this from two different perspectives, two, two different perspectives. The first one is on a personal basis, that we are personally disciples of Jesus, and we have decided to be a disciple of Jesus, to grow as a disciple of Jesus, and to go as a disciple of Jesus. And then I want us to look at it from the position of those who make disciples. That is, we make this followers of Jesus, we grow to followers of Jesus, and we send the followers of Jesus. So, you know, Matthew chapter 28 has been read many, many times at church and I know you've read it many times at home or at McDonald's or wherever it is you like to read your Bible, at work or at school, where you read your Bible. And I hope you do. I hope you carry your Bible everywhere you go. And if not there in your phone, that you whip it out and you listen to it, you, you, you read it yourself, you take the time to study God's Word. And I know you've read Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. And it still says, as it was read earlier, Jesus met with the 11 disciples on the mountainside of Galilee and they, were, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then that gives me hope. Then to give you hope, some of the ones who actually were standing in the presence of the resurrected Jesus bodily, they still doubted. Is This is too good to be true. I can't believe my own eyes. I can't believe that I touched him, that I ate with him. I can't believe that we're standing here listening to him speak. And they just, they doubted. That gives me a little bit of hope. Because quite honestly, sometimes I have doubts in my heart. Sometimes I wonder, where are you, God? So the 11, Jesus said to them, and it was written for us. 
he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore. Okay, all authority has been given to me. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. What does that make Jesus? What does that make him? Well, it makes him king, doesn't it? I mean, it makes him Lord. It makes him master. It makes him the absolute boss. In fact, Jude chapter one, of which there's only one chapter in Jude, Jude, the, the author of Jude actually calls Jesus a despot. Now, he's a loving dictator, but don't miss it. He is the dictator. He has all authority. There should be at least 17 L's on that word. All authority in heaven and on earth. God placed him above all. The only one that's not below Jesus at his feet is God the Father himself who placed all things under his son's dominion, his authority, his power. And so Jesus said, therefore, because I am Lord, therefore, go make disciples. And that word in the Greek just simply says this, while you are going, because you see, it wasn't a purposeful sending them out this time. They were going to leave the mountainside and go about their lives. And as they go, make disciples. From whom? Jesus said, out of all nations. Now, when you make disciples, there are two things you're going to do with these disciples. Number one, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the second thing is teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. And the promise to that is, I'll be with you always, even to the end of the world. You say, man, if I were to make Jesus Lord of my life, the dictator, the boss of all, and I'm going to put him number one, that is such a difficult commandment to obey. Well, you think that's difficult? Look at Matthew chapter 22, where Jesus says this to a lawyer among the Pharisees. The Pharisees had heard how he'd silenced the Sadducees. I'm in verse 34, by the way. Matthew chapter 22 and verse 34. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment of the law? Of the big 10, which one is the top? Or of the 637 commandments, which one is the number one, the greatest of all commandments? And Jesus said, this is it. Here it is. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. The second is like this. Now, the man didn't ask for the top two. He asked for the top one. But when you say this, when you've said the other one, he said the second one is like this. You can't do the first one and not do the second one. If you're going to love God, you're going to have to love other people. And if you're going to love God, watch it. You're going to love, you. you're going to love yourself. That's what he says here. He says, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor like you love yourself. How will you love yourself in a healthy way? Only if you love God in a healthy way. And that's putting him absolute first. Love him above all with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength. I mean, this is it. All your soul, all your mind. Jesus said, put him number one. You say, man, that is hard. How do you put him number one? I'm going to try my hardest to obey this commandment. Well, you think that's difficult. Look back at Matthew chapter 10. When the apostles came back after spreading the word, the kingdom of God, to, their, um, to all of their relatives and to their friends and to their neighbors and to the 10 cities, the Decapolis, they came back with exciting news. And Jesus said, don't think, this is chapter 10 and now again, verse 34, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring, bring peace, but a sword. I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, which 
maybe not have been that difficult to begin with. But still, Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace between people. I bring, came to bring a sword. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves, listen carefully, whoever loves his father or his mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Now, this is a critical thing for us to understand. Jesus has called us to love him supremely. And you cannot love anyone more than you love him him. He said, you cannot love your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, your husband, your wife, your children, even your own life. You are not to love anyone more than you love Jesus himself. I have a friend, his name is Young Gi, Hong Young Gi from South Korea. He had been a student, well, he wasn't actually a college student, but he came to live with his sister and live in the United States for a, a couple of years, and he and I became very good friends. He went with a group of us to Honduras. And while we're in Honduras, I had already started studying Bible with him, and we had talked about what it means to follow Jesus. And Young Gi said, Kevin, I have been reading my Bible. We're sitting in Honduras. He's sitting on the edge of my bed late in the evening, and he said, I just read something I cannot do. I said, what's that, young Gi? He said, I cannot love God more than my father, my mother, or my sister. I just, even my own life. I mean, how can I love, how can I love Jesus more than I love my father, my mother? They gave me everything. They brought me into this world. They, they raised me. How can I love God more than I love them? This is impossible for me. I said, well, do me a favor, would you? Keep on reading through the gospels. Get to know Jesus more. Young Gee said, okay, I will. But if that's what Jesus wants, I don't think it's possible for me to do. I said, be patient, keep on reading. That was about middle August. Later in December, five months, December. Is that five months? And Jesus, <laughs> and uh, Young Gee had watched a cartoon movie of the birth of Jesus. And there was Mary, there was Joseph, they were at the, uh, surrounded by the animals. Baby Jesus was wrapped in swaddling clothing and was placed in the manger and the animals were all mooing and buying and someone began singing the song, The Greatest Love. And in that song, it was described how the God of heaven had entered into earth, taking on our flesh, and how he would live and love and die for us and how God would raise him from the dead. And in that one song, that one cartoon movie, the Holy Spirit of God used that to penetrate his heart. And he called me and said, can we get together and talk? And I said, sure. And he said, I understand now. I understand for the first time. I understand how much God loves me. I can now love God supremely. I can follow Jesus with all of my heart and love him even more than my father or my mother or my sister or even my own life because I know the love of God. See, he had done what each of you and I have done. If you've decided to follow Jesus, what we did, we decided we were going to follow him. When we said, yes, Jesus Christ is Lord, we agreed with him. All authority in heaven and on earth, in my life, in every way, all authority is yours. You are Lord of my life. And the reason that we made him Lord of our life is because we understood, maybe for the first time, we understood the love that God has for us. Do you remember the four L's? Love. Lord, learn, live. That's what we're talking about. But we start with the love of God, not with our love. You don't start loving him. First John chapter four still says these words. We love him because he first loved us. My God loves me so much that he gave his only son 
that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If I trust Jesus and live that loving, trusting relationship with Jesus, I'm not gonna perish. As long as I live and love and trust, I will have eternal life, period. And whenever I see that Jesus said, in loving us, he said, Kevin, you are worth my life. I would die. When, look, when he went to the cross, what he said is, I'm dying to be your friend. I want to be in your life. I want to give you life. I want to give you hope. I want to fill your life with joy. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. I want you to be filled with righteous thoughts, righteous attitudes and values and beliefs, and righteous lifestyle. I want you to live the right way because I'm going to make you the right person. I want to make you a new creation. So whenever we decide to follow him, we also then decide that we're going to grow. And this growing is a long time. It takes a long time. It just doesn't happen overnight. It's not that we're instantly mature. I mean, think about it. We have instant potatoes, we have instant tea, instant coffee. We think we might have an instant Christian, just add water, right? No, 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 there's nothing instant about it. I mean, the transformation is instant. You become a child of God at a particular point in time. I believe that point in time is when you surrender yourself to Jesus and you're baptized into him. I believe that, I think the scriptures teach it. Others may argue with that, but they're wrong about other things as well. Here's the point. At that point where you become a child of God, in the same way that now I've got a brand new grandson who's only about three weeks old, there's a big difference between him at three weeks old and my son at 30, oh, let's see, 34 years old? Yeah, he's six foot Four, six foot five, weighs 200 plus pounds. My grandson weighs eight pounds, 13 some ounces. I mean, there's a big difference between the two, but you give him 34 years and watch him grow. He may be just as big, if not bigger than my son, because it takes time. And it's gonna take time for you to grow and for me to grow. But I've made the decision. I am, I've made the decision, Jesus Christ is Lord of my life and I'm going to grow to be more like him in every way. Now, what that means is this. Jesus said, go make disciples. That's a point in time when you decide you're gonna follow Jesus. But the disciple making process is different than the disciple growing process. The disciple growing process is throughout your life, you're going to learn how to live and how to love from Jesus himself. You're gonna learn how to look at life and learn to look at yourself through his eyes, not your eyes. You're gonna learn how to think like he thinks, feel like he feels and do what he did and what he does. He's going to live through you and accomplish his purposes only as you and I grow to be more like him in every way. We've made him Lord, we love him deeply, we've made him Lord, now it's time for us to learn to learn what it is, and that's why he said, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them. The baptizing them is a one-point action, teaching them is a continuous action. Teaching whom? Teaching them, the disciples that you've made and you baptized, now keep on teaching them. You're not finished yet. Way too many people come to Jesus and we, we say, okay, now where's the next one? And we go out looking for the next person we can bring to the Lord when we leave the baby. We leave the baby just laying there doing, don't take time feeding or changing diapers to help him grow. No, we've got to take some time with the young baby Christian and help that baby Christian grow to know more about the decision that he made and the trust that he has expressed and the love that he has begun to give and to live to the Lord. So you and I have done that, and we will now go into the world. You see, we've decided. We're going to grow in Jesus, and as we have decided, and we are growing, we will continue to go into the world and make disciples of other nations. So whenever we make disciples of other nations, what are we doing? Well, first of all, we're making disciples. We're sharing the good news with others. We're drawing them to make a decision. We need to help other people understand. 
Jesus Christ really is Lord. He's the king. See, when you announce the kingdom of God, you're giving them the good news of the kingdom. And what does that mean? That means this. You have the opportunity to live under King Jesus who has conquered death. He has defeated sin. He's conquered death. He gives you hope and you can live life with confidence. You can live life with assurance. With the promises of God today and assurance of eternal life tomorrow, you can face anything knowing that it's you and Jesus together. You now make a majority, you and him alone. And if that's only you and him and no one else is following him, you've decided to follow Jesus. And no matter the cost, you're going to continue to follow and continue to make others disciples. You're going to help them understand who the real Lord is of their life and not themselves, not money, not pleasure. You're going to help them understand that it is Jesus who loves them deeply and has given them so much and has said what their true value is and the one who is committed to them more than anyone ever could be. And as they decide they're going to follow Jesus and learn how to live from him, we're going to help them grow. And then not only are we going to make them disciples, that is, help them decide they're going to follow Jesus, we're going to help them to grow. We're going to then, as a church, as a group of elders, as ministers, as church family, we're going to send them into the world so that they then can also make disciples. The most important part of this is in this process of deciding and making, we're helping change complete identity. You know what happens when you have a witness protection plan? Someone takes on an entire new identity and they need to live an entirely different life. They have a new name. They have a new place to live. They have a new way of living. They have a new identity altogether. They need to be thinking differently and feeling differently and acting differently. And if they don't behave in that whole new way of a whole new person, they'll be detected and somebody's going to find out who they are. Now, here's the point. We're not in the witness protection plan, but we are in the witness change plan. He has made us his witnesses and he's changed us. His, he's changed our identity and he's made us his own. We were born into a family. We were adopted into this family. The Bible uses both terms. You were born into the family of God and you were adopted into the family of God. Watch this. This is what's so powerful to me is that whenever I say it's been uh, changed your identity, notice this in Ephesians chapter one. In Ephesians chapter one, we're told, we are told that we are adopted as children. Ephesians chapter one and verse three, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons, understand to be sons and daughters through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. Now, we've been adopted into the family, but the Bible also uses a different terminology. In 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter says this, Blessed be the God and Father. They both say God is blessed. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has, watch, caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Your identity has been so changed so that Paul could say in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation, all of the old is gone, everything has become new. Your identity has changed. You've entered into the witness protection plan of God. He's internally changing your DNA by his Holy Spirit, the seed that he has placed within you, 1 John chapter 2 and 1 Corinthians chapter 5 that I said the love of, or if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. That passage begins, verse 14, the love, the love of Christ compels us. It is love that drew us to Jesus. It's love that changes our perspective on the whole world. We no longer look at people according to the flesh. We used to look at Jesus this way, but we don't any longer. That's verse 16, by the way. Verse 17 then says, for all who are in Christ Jesus 
are new creations. Whoever's in Christ is a new creation. All of the old is gone. Everything has become new. Listen, that's some of the best news in the world because you've been looking for a new purpose, new, new identity, and God has given it. If you're a Christian, you are a new person. Accept it and live it. Find out what you have. Find out who you are. You are a disciple maker. You are a disciple grower. You are a disciple sender. You are a disciple. You're learning how to live. You're learning who you are. For the first time, maybe, you're learning who you are. This book is a self-concept book. It reveals who you are in Christ. What has God done in you? Not what you need to be doing necessarily, but what God has already done. Because I believe this. If you know who you are, you'll know how to live. You don't know how to live if you don't know who you are. You need to find out who you are in Christ Jesus. You need to find out what you have that's in Christ Jesus. That's what this book is. It's like a... It's almost like a bank statement. You've been living like you're a pauper, but God has put millions of dollars in your account. Find out what the blessings of God. That's what Ephesians chapter 1 said. It said that He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus in the heavenlies. He's given us spiritual blessings, but many of you don't know what they are because you haven't opened up your bank statement. You don't know what God has put in your account. He's given you His Holy Spirit, and with His Holy Spirit, He's given you everything He is and everything He has. You say, I can't love God like He wants me to love Him. Yes, you can. Why? How? Because He put His Spirit inside you, and listen, His Spirit pours His love into our hearts. Romans chapter 5, verse 5. Hope doesn't disappoint. Why? Because His Spirit has poured His love into our hearts. That's what it says. Go back and look at it. Romans 5, verse 5. What kind of love are we talking about? The love that says when you were hopeless, when you were helpless, when you were sinners, when you were my enemy, Christ died for you to bring you back in relationship with me, God said. Now, this is critical because if you know what you have, rather who you have, you need to always remember who you are and whose you are. And if in the morning you wake up and you say, I know who I am, God, I'm your child. I'm your daughter. I'm your son. I'm your priest. I'm a part of your body. I'm a citizen of your kingdom. I'm a sheep of your pastor. So many things the Bible says you are. God has made you that. I now know I'm learning God what I have, who I have, who I belong to. I'm yours. I'm totally yours. You're my Lord. I'm your slave. You're my master. You're my boss. Whatever it is you say to do, I will do because you are who you are in my life and I love you supremely. You know where you're going, not just in heaven someday. You know that through the life, through this life, you are going wherever it is the Holy Spirit is directing you to go in ways that He's directing you to go into other people's lives so that you can put in a good word for Jesus. Where are you going? I don't know exactly where I'm going. Every day, I don't set out a specific plan necessarily, but I'm, I'm praying. God, take me where you want me to go and introduce me to, who, to whom you want me to know. And you have a new why. Why are you doing what you're doing? <laughs> Here it is. In all you do, in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 33, when he's talking about eating meat or drinking wine, he said, whether I eat or or I drink, or whatever I do, I do it all to the glory of God. That is so critical for you and for me to grab hold of and understand. That's this, my life, the purpose that I have in my life is to bring God glory. And as I comprehend His love, I will live a wow God kind of life. I will live to His glory for His pleasure so that I can hear His applause. I can hear His praise. I want to hear Him say, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. I want to hear the same words that were spoken to Jesus spoken to me. Whenever He says, you come into the joys of the kingdom. One day that's going to happen. 
But until that day, I want to hear it today. I want to feel the hand on the back today. I want to hear the applause of God today. I want heaven to stand on its hind feet, and I want them all to applaud and say, look at what he's learned. Look at what he's doing. Don't you want that too? What would it be like for you to today recommit yourself to the very purposes we're talking about, that you will decide Jesus Christ is fully Lord in every respect. This is a constant decision every day we die to ourselves. Paul said, I die daily. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life that I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and he gave himself for me. I died. I die every day. I have been crucified together with Christ and yet I live. Not I, but Christ lives in me. The, the life that I've decided, I continue to decide. Every day, I want to live for Him. I want to grow to be more like Him. I want to see life through His eyes. And the only way you can do that is to open up your book and get your head in the book and get the book in your head. Then it goes into your heart. You start feeling what he feels. You start valuing what he values and you gain the perspective that he has because you recognize your position has changed. You're taking up your cross to follow him and all the days of your life, you're going to then go and wherever you go, you're going to be making other disciples, helping them grow and sending them into the world. And my friend, those are the three stages of being a disciple of Christ. Pray with me one more time, would you? Lord, help us as we decide to decide fully to surrender to you in every way. Help us to, to recognize your call for us to grow and not stagnate. Now we would never become stagnant, but rather we would fully devoted, be devoted to you every day of our life. And that you are, you are yourself devoted to us. You've called us your own, you've given us your life, and you've given us great value. You're committed to us, help us to do the same as we commit to you and we commit to each other. Help us, Lord, to value ourselves as well, to love ourselves and be committed to our own best so that we can love and value and commit to other people as well. Help us, Lord, as a church family, send people into the world to help make disciples so that this whole world would one day be under your control. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.